Good morning and welcome to the NBA Daily for October 31st, 2024. Coming up, the Celtics put a spook into the Pacers. The Lakers suffer a horrifying loss to the Cavs. And S is going to thrill us with his sophomores that stood out last night. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, S. Happy Halloween, everybody. Woo, we got the Celtics and Pacers last night, S, and oh, these yeah. teams, I don't think they like each other. Uh, th- this They really like play hard against each other. They're competing like it was the playoffs out there. If, if you're a Pacers fan, at least you felt that way. Yeah, it felt like a playoff game the entire time. Uh, I love that Indy gets up to play the Celtics. Like you yeah. can feel it with the way that they, and th- this is one of those games where you're like, oh, maybe they're going to turn the corner. They were struggling a little bit to start the year. This this win is one yeah. of those games where it's like, hey, well, chip on our belt. We beat the Boston There you Celtics, go. I right? kind of buried the lead there. Uh, the Celtics lose their first game of the season in overtime to to the uh, Pacers. It's 135-132. They lose in OT. And the, the Pacers actually had this game seemingly locked up yes. at one point. S, to the point where you and I started saying, man, our game of the night might not be much of a game. Uh, but then... The Celtics just did the thing that they do because they are inevitable and they just continued to shoot threes. They wound up with 57 threes in this game, S, which keyed their comeback. 19 made threes. They only shot 33%, but the volume got them back in the game. And and I want to start with the beginning of this game for the Pacers because they started out so well. They were they were keeping Boston off the three-point line, limiting them in transition. They were switching a lot. Boston only got three three-point attempts in the first six minutes. And, and I think this got Boston out of rhythm because when yeah. they actually started getting the looks, getting inside, working the ball outside and getting some open looks, they just weren't falling. I actually think the Pacers are well-equipped to play five out with the Celtics and kind of keep banging with them uh, in, a, in a weird way. You mentioned the defensive aspect, but I thought a guy like Isaiah Jackson really brought a different element to the Pacers defense because – You know, low side, weak side help. He's there roaming around. They can kind of shrink the court a little bit more when they're switching everything. And so that stops some of the dribble penetration stuff the Celtics were trying to do. If you limit them early in the game, get them out their rhythm, that gives you more of a chance against Boston. And obviously we saw that tonight. They they did not shoot well to start the game. The Celtics did what they did regularly. I mean, that especially in the fourth quarter, the Jason Tatum, Derek White actions, they just kept running that and spamming that, and it, it got them back into the game. Uh, but I thought this was this was an awesome performance from Pascal Siakam. Which, yeah. like, I mean, when he plays at the five for them, and he, he, they're kind of running and gunning, and obviously he knocked down his threes. He had six threes tonight. Um, it's really fun to watch this Pacers offense when he gets activated like that. Yeah. And, and with the ball pressure and stuff that, that they were able to apply, it, it just yeah. threw Boston off. And we saw this in the playoffs last year. The, the reason that the Pacers had so much success defensively, full court ball pressure, picking the ball up at half court. Jalen Brown struggled in this game to shoot and find rhythm. And yeah. I don't think that that's a surprise. Like they did that on purpose. Um, there was just so much stuff. This is again, another crazy night in the league. <laughs> Carl Anthony towns showed up big for the Knicks. The Knicks get a big win. Uh, they, they beat the heat 116, 107. Carl towns scores 44 points. I think, yep. look, that's great. And he scored a lot. He took 25 shots. He took five threes. He, he made four of that's them. That's the one. That's yeah. the important part. Yep. It's a big deal. I mean, we were talking with James Edwards, you know, just a couple of days ago, and he was saying they got to find a way to, to get more three point attempts, 40s for yeah. the game. I, I thought I thought honestly that they ran a lot more delay actions for him where he was being the playmaker. And that's part of what we talked about with James, too. Um uh, was impressed with the fact that he was crashing the glass more 13 rebounds. He had Mm -hmm. three offensive rebounds that were big, especially towards the fourth quarter. Uh, I just thought that he brought it physically. And when he's imposing, when he's setting hard screens, when he's obviously shooting the ball with confidence, I think it just adds another level for the Knicks. And they took 43s today, which it's like they, they, they remembered that they could shoot the basketball. (laughs) Mikael Bridges, you know? uh, in spite of the the shooting form issues that we saw to start the year, I mean, he took 11 threes. He hit four of them in this game. Jalen yeah. Brunson still hasn't found his jumper yet. I mean, a part of that is that they throw three or four guys at him 
every totally. single time, and, and he has to dribble so much to get to his spots. But what I really liked was nine assists in this game. Like he was actually getting the ball to do some of the work for them, which is something that they need a, a little bit more, uh, especially from him because he's got the ball so much. Um, yeah. Chet versus Wimby was tonight, and and I think um, if you were looking at the scoreboard, it's it's two wins toward OKC. Oklahoma City wins the game, but Chet Holmgren wins the head-to-head matchup. It was yep. stark, the difference. Um, you know, Wemby got a little banged up in this game, uh, and maybe that affected him down the stretch. But Chet came out looking to just crush Wemby. I mean, he almost he almost had him on a bunch of highlight reels. It was It was funny because before the game, we saw that quote where it's like, Chet, you know, Wemby doesn't even say Chet's name, yeah. you know, it's kind of, he's kind of like Voldemort in San Antonio, you know, in the sense that he does not, he who ha- shall not be spoken or whatever the name yeah. is that they do. In he who shall not be named. I think is there how it go. goes. That's what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, but no, I thought Wemby struggled a lot today. And yeah. that part of that was the coverage that OKC was throwing at him. Like as soon as he caught the ball in the mid to high post area, he was seeing two or three bodies just a lot of physicality from OKC side. He's of things. still a little thin too, man. Like yeah. we, people yeah. keep saying he gained weight. I, I don't see it. Maybe he gained two and a half kilos, not twenty five pounds. <laughs> I don't think he put on that much weight. I mean, yeah. even that is probably too much. A- a- Alice Caruso's guarding him up yeah. at the up at the elbow uh, at one point in this game, and, and part of I, I think the the scouting report on him on him is if you get up underneath him with a smaller player right. who's strong, you can hold him out of the lane. Especially because he's so tall. Like exactly. that seven five frame, the way that Caruso is guarding him, he's actually going much lower than what he would usually. He's in his liver. Yeah. You know, right. That's tough. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've ever boxed S, but uh, a liver shot does not feel great. It's painful. Yeah. And um, we got it. Look, it, it was late, but um, we got to talk about the Warriors because uh, they win back to back games against the Pelicans. No Steph Curry. Um, it doesn't seem to matter. Uh, Jonathan Kuminga has looked really good back to back games. One hundred four eighty nine. They beat the Pelicans. Kum- yeah. Kuminga. Uh, comes off the bench again, 16 points. Buddy healed off the bench, 21 points. And here's how I know Steve Kerr has gotten a little bit of a coaching bump from the Olympics. He, he's feeling empowered. He started Lindy Waters the third in this game. Oh, yeah. The oh, yeah. hand. He's feeling comfortable, right? He's feeling confident. Yeah. That's I, I love doing that. I mean, that's that's what great coaches do. It's like feeding the guy who is playing with the utmost confidence. Uh, Buddy Hilt had another good game where he's just shooting the lights out. But I, I think the one thing that stands out for me with the Warriors is their defense, right? That's right. They were the number two defense going into uh, tonight's game. They likely are going to remain the number two defense. OKC and Golden State, actually, funny enough, one and That's two right. defensively. I, I think they are likely going to remain a top five defense. To your point. You know, when we were doing our predictions and boldness, it just does seem that hey. they're a pretty good defensive team. And by the they way, OKC will probably man. stay number one. They yep, said I right. was a madman. Uh, you right. Coming up after the break, we talked to Jovan Buha about the Lakers' fallout from their second consecutive loss. After starting the season 3-0, and the Lakers have dropped their last two, including last night's game, to the Cavaliers where they got blown out. Joining us to talk about it, Jovan Buha, our Los Angeles Lakers beat writer at The Athletic. Jovan, you're in the building. Uh, I think we got to start with the big story for the Lakers, and that is Bronny James has broken the streak. He scored his first NBA bucket in Cleveland, where yes. he's from. Uh, you know, the crowd was cheering for Bronny. It was actually like a pretty nice moment. I mean, they've known this kid his entire life. Uh, you were in the building. Tell us about it. It was incredible. So first thing, getting here outside of the Lakers locker room, they had this uh, you know, rotating photos welcoming back uh, LeBron and Bronny. Actually, welcome back like D'Angelo Russell because he went to the Ohio State and uh, some other Lakers staffers. But the big ones, of course, were Bronny and Lewis LeBron. and Clark in that video, and, too. Uh, <laughs> no, just <laughs> um, but I mean, basically. And uh, so. That I mean, that was it was an 11 year old Bronny celebrating the 2016 title. So that that was kind of put things in perspective of, of just how long this journey has been to this point. Uh, but then you have during you know pregame introductions, the crowd goes wild for LeBron as expected. Uh, but then during the first time out, they do a video tribute 
uh, to LeBron and Bronny. And LeBron was pissed because at that point, the Lakers were down 20 to 15. And, and Cle- <laughs> it was already starting to get away from them. So LeBron was like, I was just locked in, like not really paying attention. Like I heard it, but I, I wasn't looking up. But then I heard Bronny's name and then I looked up and like kind of soaked in the moment. So um, for, for the Lakers, it was a very disappointing evening and uh, I think a bit deflating considering their 3-0 and start. But for Bronny and, and LeBron personally, Bronny got uh, the, the game ball afterwards. He, he kept his number nine jersey and he scored his first NBA points, which... Uh, you know, we weren't sure when that was going to happen, uh, if not tonight, uh, because he should be joining the, the G League team, uh, the South Bay Lakers soon. So uh, it, from that sense, you know, a lot had been building toward this. And LeBron and, and Bronny both spoke to that post game of just uh, you know, all the conversations and, and training they've done together through the years. And LeBron was like, as a father, like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Like, just being able to watch your son actualize their dreams and he was like, since Bronny touched the basketball, this has been his dream to play in the NBA, to score a basket in the NBA, and he did it. Well, um, from the greatest thing in the world to LeBron James to not the greatest thing in the world, <laughs> the Lakers, <laughs> their defense. Uh, transition was a problem for him tonight. Oh, yeah. It, they had issues in the half court. I mean, just perimeter defense has been a problem for them so far this season. This is back-to-back games where they've just kind of been carved up uh, on the outside. I mean, you know, it's early. But do they have the personnel to be able to guard it, the NBA teams they need to guard? I mean, we know Anthony Davis is a defensive player of the year level player. I mean, and maybe should have been in some people's mind last season. But is that enough? I don't think so. I think that this is the glaring uh, deficiency with this group right now is the perimeter defense. And it's something that they're likely going to have to address uh, on the trade market at some point, if, you know, depending on how they start the season, uh, Lakers GM and, and vice president of basketball operations, Rob Polinka said he wanted to give this group 30 games before he truly judged them. And so I, I think we'll, we'll have a better idea of where they're at, at the 30 game mark. Uh, but certainly t- to your point, like entering tonight, they were sixth, uh, per cleaning the glass, they were sixth in half court defense and 30th in transition defense. Wow. And 30th by like a, a significant amount. They're, they're adding about eight points per hundred possessions to their opponents, uh, in, or giving up an extra, you know, additional eight points per hundred possessions to their opponents, uh, in transition. So that's, I mean, that's significant. And if you look at LeBron and AD for as good as they can be in a half court situation with their athleticism and their size and their length, neither one of those guys is, is great at getting back in transition. Typically uh, LeBron of course will have the occasional chase down block. And uh, you, you saw even tonight, Sam Merrill had a potential layup in transition and he saw LeBron coming and, and heard the footsteps and he dribbled the ball out and, and did not go you know, challenge him. But outside of, uh, of that, you know, th- this is a LA team that really struggles defending in transition. Uh, Kenny Atkinson said as much pregame that uh, he was kind of like, that's the way we need to attack them because their half court defense is too good. Uh, but then in, in on the perimeter, like we, we've seen this group is switching one through four and that works in certain matchups, but whether it was Kevin Durant and Devin Booker uh, against Phoenix the other night or uh, Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell uh, with, with Cleveland, they were able to, pick on certain guys, be it D'Angelo Russell or uh, even dragging out some of the bigs and just blowing by them and getting to the rim. So uh, that's something that the Lakers are, are going to have to really look at and potentially, I, I think, tweak because I, while switching one through four sounds good in theory, I don't know if they have the personnel to do it. I don't know if it's sustainable. So I, I think they're probably going to have to come up with a, a defensive scheme change uh, pretty quickly. Jovan, they've talked about three-point shooting a lot uh, from the Lakers. J.J. Redick has asked them to shoot the ball more. Uh, tonight, just 28 attempts, 21% from the three-point line, too. And I know this team doesn't necessarily have the three-point shooting talent. You look at a guy like Austin Reeves, who started the year well, D'Angelo Russell, who can obviously shoot the ball. But is that a recipe that can work for them offensively to space the floor for a guy like LeBron James and Anthony Davis and Rui Hachimura too, who has started off the year well? Yeah, I think it can. But to your point, I always think this is going to be an inside out offense. Mm -hmm. Uh, AD and LeBron are two of the best finishers in the league, uh, two of the best foul drawers in the league. And I think that's always going to be this group's bread and butter. Like last year, they were second in the league and, points in the paint they were second in the league in points in the paint entering tonight so like that's always the way i think this offense is going to function it's, it's going to be inside out and if you load up the paint then they get good shots uh and enter tonight actually is the fifth best 
three point shooting team in terms of percentage, but obviously from a volume perspective, they, they continue to be down there, uh, you know, around the bottom 10. So it, it's something that JJ's harped on. Uh, we, we saw some mixed results in the preseason, but I don't think as currently constructed, this is a group that's going to be taking that many threes. Uh, right. I think they could do a better job of, of seeking it out and that they have guys in. Austin, Dilo, Rui, who do like to live in the mid range and, um, they, they've been trying to work on cutting those shots out of their diet. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's still a work in progress for sure. And, um, you know, J, it's something JJ is constantly referencing in, in his post game interviews of just kind of looking at the three point battle tonight. They were minus 33 uh, against Cleveland, which is just like, he, I mean, JJ was basically like, it's, it's a math problem, right? Like yeah. if, if you're giving up, you know, if you're losing that uh, by that margin at the three point line, like you, you're going to be losing most games. So I think for them, it's that's the offensively, I would say you're finding ways to generate better threes and increasing the volume, uh, staying organized and structured. And then defensively, again, kind of figuring out their, their new switching scheme and, and ways to kind of prevent uh, defenses from picking on their weaker defenders. Uh, I'm glad you brought up JJ and, and some of the stuff that he said first weekend. What's the biggest difference that you've noticed first yeah. weekend with real games? You've been on the road with them. I mean, what are you picking up on? Cause it's different. Yeah. Um, so I would say, um, and it's, it's, I hate doing the, the comparison uh, because it's been a big thing with the fan base, but um, you know, last season there was a game when the Lakers were at arguably the low point of their season where Darvin Ham said that fans need to stop living and dying w- with every loss. And that, <laughs> I remember that. Was, oh. was basically a death knell <laughs> to the fan base because Laker fans live and die with every loss. This is a team that expects every season, no matter how good or bad the roster is, to contend for championships, you know, have playoff aspirations, and, and really just um, you know, win every game that they play. Like th- that's kind of been the Lakers history, right? So, uh, I-, I think that the fan base has high expectations and to see JJ Reddick after his first loss, uh, that loss in Phoenix. Oh, he like, looked like he, got, he, he was something fuming. bad or something. Yeah. He yeah. was fuming. And like the more, like the longer the press conference went on, like at first you could tell he was upset, but like he, he was trying to keep his composure and, and just answer the questions. But the more he kept talking about the game, he was getting progressively angrier and like there's there's just a care factor with JJ that um I, I don't think it's performative right like all, all the players afterward were talking about his post game uh message to the team and and how he he dropped an F bomb and he was fuming and seething and it was just like this dude really cares and he was really eaten up about losing his first NBA game so um i, I think like just just that level of intensity and and focus from JJ, you can just tell is, is really seeped into the team outside of this Cleveland loss. Uh, but in general, I would say like offensively, this was already a team that was top five over the last like 45 games or so last season. So they, they've just done a lot of those things, but at a higher level and been very organized, very structured. Uh, he runs brilliant ATOs and they pretty much score on, on almost every ATO he, he you know, calls. So, uh, that's been impressive. And then defensively, I think he's really focused on team defense and zoning up the backside because they just don't have the perimeter defenders to keep guys in front of them. So yeah. a lot of it is about the low man rotations and, and sort of playing team defense and really trying to keep guys out of the paint that way. Yeah. Well, let's hope he doesn't run out of napkins with plays on him anytime <laughs> soon. And those ATOs are still successful because it is nice to see people running plays out of timeouts, just a wasted opportunity when you don't do it. Yovan Buha, go and read him over at the athletic. He covers the Lakers better than anybody else in the business. Thank you very much for joining us after the break. S and I are going to talk about some of his favorite sophomores from last night. You know, occasionally you have young players that get stuck on bad teams, and it just means that nobody gets to see them. You know, if you're playing for the Wizards and you do something, does anyone know what happens, S? They They forget. Yeah. So we thought... Why don't we set aside time to pay attention to some of these younger players who are up and coming? Because otherwise, it's, it's hard to keep track. And uh, so we put S on the assignment. And S, we had a couple of sophomores tonight that stood out to you. Uh, I yeah. would, would love to talk through them. Thank you. If a tree falls in the woods, do you hear it type of thing? Yeah, I mean, if I'm there, yes. But no one's at a Wizards game. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And look, the Wizards just beat the Hawks twice in a row. 
right? They have their number, if you will, early on in the season. Uh, a big reason is Bilal Koulibaly, who second year player, right? Stepping up this sophomore who had his career high tonight, 27 points. I mm-hmm. thought he did a great job of using his athleticism. I know you're high on him. He had a really nice pull-up jumper. He's hitting his threes more in stride, shooting. And I guess I, I think I'm I'm higher on what the Wizards are building than I was maybe a year ago because of the infrastructure that they're building around a guy like Bilal. Yeah. I like Alex Sar. I like some of these other guys. I think I think the identity they're trying to build is interesting. Well, I mean, the fact that his defense is where it is right now, and, and not just on the ball, but off the ball too. He's totally. high level defender, pays attention. Offensively, he's got more than I think people expected him to have at this point. Although when I watch the tape on him coming out of France, I mean, the guy he remind me of, Paul George. You know what I mean? He's kind of got a little bit of that. He's not as he smooth has a little as Paul bit of George. It. Not as smooth. Yeah, not, not as not smooth, smooth, but he's got a little bit. It just made me feel that way. And, and it's not a comp. It's just watching him play. You know, he's yeah. got those tools. He, he does a lot of things that are similar. Uh, who's the well, other guy? I have, a, I have oh, a comp oh. for this next guy. I have oh, a comp okay. for this next guy. Okay. All right. Um, this guy also second year player had his career high tonight. Grady Dick for the Toronto Raptors. Obviously no Scotty Barnes. He's out for a few weeks with that um, eye injury. But I, I think, look, he dropped 30 points tonight. Didn't shoot the ball well from behind the arc. You know, he's supposed hasn't to be the shot sharp the ball shooter. Well. And hasn't shot the ball well, you know, but it's, it's, the fact that he's able to get to 30 points without shooting the three, which is so intriguing. He's hitting 56% of his pull-up jumpers this year. So just absurd volume, absurd efficiency on that front. D- doing a great job off ball, like relocating, you know, mm-hmm. all the things that you like from a shooter. So look, Grady is my Peja Stojakovic. That's my <laughs> comp for Grady. That's amazing. That's the guy well, I'm, he's I'm shooting dropping. like Kevin Durant right now. Do you think that's sustainable for him? Do you feel <laughs> like not. Kevin Durant from the mid range for Grady Dick is, is no, what we but, should expect? You know, if we're throwing out crazy comps, you know, he, I'm just. Oh. Oh, I will just say right now, uh, you guys uh, send us emails at NBA daily at the athletic.com or hit us up on Twitter uh, and let us know what you think about our cops. Who's got the better cop? Thank you. Thank you. All right, hey, by Paul the way, George the Pistons got a W today. I'm just letting you know. And the Pistons won a game, yeah. you know, but still, my top five defense warriors looking like a better pick all than right, your Pistons right. for the play-in. That's going to do it for today's show, folks. Thank you guys for tuning in. For S. Marahenny, I'm Dave DeFore, and this has been the NBA Daily. Thanks for waking up with us. Mm-hmm.